good to be with you guys. We love City Life Church. This feels like home. Me and my husband, we've been pastoring together. We were youth pastors before we were church planters. And I was thinking this morning, honestly, I think that we've kind of over the years got into our rhythm where he's really the strategy piece where he's constantly looking at the vision and where we're going. I feel like I've kind of settled into this culture piece. So what I, I really do at Sun City Church is I oversee our pastoral teams, so our small groups, our college, our youth, our kids, all of the pastoral side of the church, that's like my jam, and it's really my passion. I love it. So I feel like even today, the words that we're going to be sharing they're kind of in line with that. He has some really strategic stuff on moving from here to there. But in this first service, I wanted to share some culture pieces on really understanding, God, what is it that you have for us as a church community? And where is it you've called us to go? And during worship, I felt like he even dropped this, this word into my spirit for you guys. And, and it's this thought that over all of creation, God looks out, and there's not a square inch that he doesn't proclaim mine. And you might have heard that before, but I was just thinking about that this morning. God looks out over creation, and he feels possessive towards it. This is mine. And it's easy for us to kind of get in this mindset, well, you know, I'm kind of doing my thing. I'm doing, you know, whatever it is that's in my everyday rhythm, and there's like this flow that's going on around me. Culture kind of has their thing that they're doing. Everybody's kind of in this rhythm. And, and sometimes we just lose sight of the fact that God is on the move. Yes. And that there's something that he has specifically for you as an individual, for your family. There's something that he has for your community and he feels possessive about it. He's looking out over your communities, your neighborhoods, your church. He's looking out over San Francisco. And he doesn't have the same kind of emotions or feelings that lots of times other people have. It's like, ooh, look at where everything is going. We feel kind of nervous about what's happening. What about all the political tension that's taking place? What about, you know, what's happening over here, over there? God looks out over it, and he declares, mine. This is mine. And I believe God would plant something in your spirit today, a whole new level of understanding the possessiveness that he has about the way that you see your future, about the way that you're living your life, and about what it is that he has for the rest of 2020. So I want to talk to us about closing the gap between here and there. And really the whole idea is that we're in a here, but there is a there. There's somewhere that God has called us to go to. And some of us, we tend to focus on there. We like to dream. We like to vision cast. We like to think about it. In fact, we can be a little bit more kind of attached to there than sometimes we are here. And even though here might feel kind of bad and there's some struggles and there's some difficulty, we're constantly speaking maybe positively about it and looking at tomorrow with this hope-filled perspective that it's going to get better on the other side. And some of us, we need to, to kind of just settle into, okay, we are here, and we got to face the reality of here's where I'm at in my relationships, my friendships, my community, maybe my relationship with God. i, I got to maybe face the reality a little bit clearer so that I can move there and not live so much in tomorrow that we don't deal with today. But then some of us, we tend to focus on here. We tend to focus on like, oh, look at all the difficulty. There's all the pain. There's all the heartache. There's all the frustration. And for some of us, we get, we get kind of discouraged by all that's here. And maybe it causes us to get a little apathetic in our relationship with God, a little apathetic inside of what it is that we're doing for God and with God and what he wants to do through us because we're so focused on here. So today I want to look at both of those things. There's a here. We've got to face it. We've got to acknowledge it. We've got to understand what's in our here because lots of the decisions we've made have led us to this moment. And if we don't understand the decisions that brought us here, we won't know how to change them in order to get there. But I also want to spend some time going, God, what is it you have for us there? 
And everyone, they end up somewhere, but few end up there on purpose. Everyone ends up somewhere. Few end up there on purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good, and they're not for disaster. They're to give you a future and a hope. It's like the GPS. You know, I, I live off those things. You have any directionally challenged people in the room? Danny, we have different difficulties when it comes to directions. Danny really gets turned around as to where he even is. Like, are we, are we headed this direction or this direction? He has no idea. For me, like, if I've been there one time, I can remember how to get back there, but I can't tell anyone else how to get there. I'm like the person that gives directions. Like, you turn at the white building, and then there's a dog on the other side of the street. You turn left there. Like, that's the kind of direction. I have no idea what street it is. I just know how to get back there. And so if I'm in the car, I could lead someone back there, but that's the extent of it. But the, the thing about our GPS or, you know, Siri or whatever we have on our phones is it's not actually the thing that's telling us where to go. It's actually being programmed to just take us where it is that we want to go, right? You don't get in your car. All of a sudden, it takes control, and it takes you wherever it is it wants to go. You program into it, here's where I want to go, and then it gives you the step-by-step -step instructions on how to get there. And so you have to look at 2020 and go, God, what is it you called me to do? Where is it you've called me to go? So that you can begin to tell your life and your habits and your decisions, here's what's going to line up with where it is God's taking me this year. I, I wonder if for some of you, God's calling you out of shallow relationships into something deeper. I wonder if he's calling you out of going to church into being the church. I wonder if he's calling you out of wandering into a place of focus. And he, he hasn't asked you to do it. He hasn't asked you to go anywhere all by yourself. God actually has called you to go alongside of others. And Danny's going to really focus on that inside of the second service. So if you can, I'd encourage you to stick around for it. Because here today, I'm going to talk to you about the vertical channels of grace that God gives us to get from here to there. When God comes and he says, I'm taking you from where you're at to where I want you to go, he's the one that enables us to get there. And he has these, these channels of grace, really his divine empowerment and help that enable us to do that. And then he has also these horizontal channels of grace that come in the form of relationships. And so I'm going to talk to you about these vertical channels of grace. He's going to talk to you about these horizontal channels of grace. I'm really going to talk to you about the culture of your own life in your own church. He's going to talk to you about the strategy that you need in order to move into that next place. I was thinking about road trips in my life. And we went on a lot of road trips when I was younger. I, I grew up in the mountains in the middle of nowhere. And so we would travel to go visit my grandma and grandpa all the, all the time. And I had a grandma that loved to fill you up with all kinds of snacks as you're getting ready to go. Anybody have a grand grandma like that? Like we would get ready to leave and she would like empty the cupboards, you know? It would be like everything that she's had for the past five years, she's loading into our car. It's like she thinks that, you know, this three hour trip that we're going on, we're gonna need like food for an entire month to make sure that we get there. Grandma was always like that. It was always really helpful. You feel like if you, you have Mountain Dew and Cheetos and Red licorice, that was really a big deal. You know, if you have all of those things, we're going to be fine. And as a kid, that was all I was concerned about. But then my parents, they were always concerned about, you know, the more pressing things like, do we have gas in the car? <laughs> Which is great if you have Cheetos, not so great if you don't have gas, right? And so my dad was always thinking through making sure, you know, that the oil was changed and that the tires were good, whether or not we had chains, if we were going over snowy passes. He was thinking about the deeper things. And I found that, you know, a lot of times we get focused on the, the little things, like making sure we got snacks for the journey. Sometimes we don't have gas in the car. We need gas in the car to get from here to there. And that's really what I want to talk to you about is what it is that God, he's providing for you in relationship with him that is the fuel that gets you from one place to the next. Authentic relationship with God is the power that drives transformation 
in our lives. Authentic relationship with God. Not just surface level. Not riding on somebody else's relationship with God. Not borrowing from other people on a Sunday morning. Authentic relationship with God is the fuel that gets you to where you want to go. And I, I, I want to I wanna give you this picture that really stuck out to me this last year. And the picture really is of how God relates to us as a father. All of our siblings, me and my husband, actually, all of them are in foster care. So we have, actually, we have five foster nephews and nieces that we're praying get adopted this year. So we have foster kids kind of all around us. And Romans 8.15 is something I've focused on a lot this year because now all of a sudden it, it has a whole new meaning for me as the aunt of all of these little guys and girls that have been brought into our family. And it says this in Romans 8.15, it says, you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. So now we call him Abba Father. And it's, it struck me how impactful this new relationship we have with God is. Because we, ha we have all these kids that have grown up in our family, actually. And from the moment that they were born, the only thing that they ever knew was how our family does things. They've only ever known their aunts and their uncles and the way that we do Christmases, the way that we do birthdays. This has been their reality from the moment that they opened their eyes and they took their first breath. But now there's these little, these little kids that they had a different reality before they joined our family. I began to watch the world through their eyes. Just this last summer, we were spending this day out at the lake. We had all of the family, and we're hanging out at the water. And they had all these canoes and kayaks and all these, all these things that all the kids, they were playing on. They're out there in kind of the shallow parts of the water, just, you know, going crazy, having fun. And, and one of the little foster nephews, he's, he's maybe two years old, he really wanted to go out with all of the bigger kids. You want to be out there playing with them. And so my dad, Papa is what they call him, he offers to take him out on, on the lake. And so he goes to get this kayak. I get it, the little guy all fitted, you know, with the life vest. And I start walking him out on the dock. All of a sudden, he throws his arms around me, and he's clinging to me for dear life. He's like, no, 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 I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And... There was this realization in that moment that what I knew about my dad, what all of the kids who had been born into our family knew about my dad, this little guy didn't know about my dad. I have this understanding of my dad that every single time I ever jumped off the edge of the pool, he was there to catch me. He would be there for every sports event that I ever had cheering me on. Even when I was much older in college, my dad would go out and like heat up the car, make sure it was warm before I like went out and got in it. I knew a dad that was attentive and caring, paid attention, was always fighting for my good. That's not the reality that this little guy knew. So there in the moment, it was, it was actually like, I didn't know what to do, He's, he didn't wanna go with Papa who's coming in the kayak to get him. And so I tried a logic, it was my only plan, is you know, the ant, you get to try things sometimes. So I just decided like this little two-year-old, me and him are just gonna have this conversation. I said, you know, Papa isn't gonna let you fall in the water. And to my absolute surprise, he said, Papa's not gonna let me fall in the water. I said, no, Papa's gonna make sure that you're safe. He repeats it back again, Papa's gonna make sure I'm safe. He starts to like loosen the grip on my neck. Papa's gonna make sure you have a fun time. Papa's gonna make sure I have a fun time. All of a sudden he loosens his arms and I hand him over to my dad who's waiting in the kayak. And they go off on this adventure out on the lake. And now there's an availability for this little guy to explore places that he, he didn't have access to before. Because of his relationship and his willingness to trust the relationship 
of Papa in his life, now he's able to explore what all the other kids are experiencing. And he's able to get to the other side and see things that he could never see before. And that's the kind of relationship that God, he wants to have with you. It's the fuel in your life that moves you from here to there. What you didn't have access to before, you now have access to. A whole new world opens up to you. And well, I didn't know I could have that kind of experience in my life where I'm fulfilled and I'm satisfied in the job that I'm in and the community that I have around me. I didn't know I could have this kind of purpose. I didn't know I could have this kind of marriage. I didn't know I could have this kind of relationship with my own child after what I experienced. Everything changes when you have an authentic relationship with God. And what wasn't available to you before is now available to you. I want to I want to dive into this story in the little time that I have left. It's this story that maybe if you've been coming to church for a while, you would be familiar with. It's the disciples and it's their experience that they have with Jesus actually right after he's died and he is resurrected. So now finally this there's this conclusion to what's been going on, and they've just been in the fog. They've had no idea what's happening. Jesus was saying, hey, I'm here. I'm not, I'm not here to really gain the political kind of authority you think that I am. I'm actually here to die for the sins of humanity, and they were just like totally lost in left field. What? What's happening? And even as he's walking to the cross, they're just out in left field, not understanding what's happening, but he does everything that he said he was going to do. He dies on that cross. Three days he's in the ground, and then he's resurrected. All of it's happened, and yet still they're not really clear on what Jesus is doing, and I think it's evidenced by what happens in this scene. And we look at John 21, and we find Jesus' disciples, they're on a fishing boat, because that's what they used to do. That's what they knew before Jesus they knew how to fish. So even though they've seen what it is that he's doing, now they're not really, they're really not sure what happens now. Okay, you died, you're back from the dead. But what do we, what do, we do now, Jesus? So they go back to fishing. And it says in John 21, starting in verse 2, several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and the two other disciples, and Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing at all. Nothing all night long. And there's this sense that here in this moment, they kind of feel like it's over. You know, you came, you did what you were going to do. Totally surprised us. We just... We just did not see it coming, Jesus. But here we are. You did what you were going to do. I'm sure they don't really feel that great about their role in it. You know, before they were kind of hoping that this was going to turn out really well for them. In the end, they all kind of ran away. Jesus did his thing. He comes out the victor. And they're kind of going like, okay, well, that's it. That's, that's the end. Roll the credits. It's a crazy chapter of our life. But then it goes on. Jesus actually ends up having breakfast with these guys. And at breakfast, starting in verse 15, it says, After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. All of a sudden, hey, Peter, there's something for you to do. This isn't over. Your destiny isn't out on the fishing boat going back to the life that you once knew. He actually is giving him another assignment, even after he totally failed the last one. Jesus repeats the question, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Peter, this is not the end. This is not the finish. This is the beginning. This is just the beginning. 
I brought you all the way to this point, and now here you are here, and there's a there that I'm calling you to, and there's a relationship that I want to have with you, and as I walk with you, you're going to see something that you have never even imagined possible. This is only the beginning. John 10, 10 says, my purpose is to give them rich and satisfying life. And I hear today, I feel like God brought me here to tell you there's something on the horizon for 2020. Something for your marriage. There's something for your relationships. There's something in your freedom. Freedom from depression or anxiety or addictions in your life. There's some focus, there's some purpose, there's something God's called you to do. There's an assignment from heaven for you. And you might be thinking like, okay, great. I could use an upgrade. Let's move from here to there, but there's something that God's called you to do in it. It's like Jesus came to Peter and said, Peter, go feed my sheep. There's a role that you play in this. You gotta, you gotta be willing to get in the boat. You got to be willing to go with him to where it is that he's taking you. So I just want to, I want to give you three things. Of how to move from here to there into the specific plans that God has for your life. And the first one, the first one's not going to surprise you if you've been around church for a while. It's simply listen to what God is saying. Listen to what he's saying. And I think it's easy for us to sometimes get into this place where we're coming to church or maybe we, we're coming to our, our life groups and we're kind of leaning on God speaking to and through other people. Maybe we're not leaning in and we're hearing what it is he's trying to say to us individually. But it says inside of Isaiah 30, 21, your own ears, they will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. It says inside of John 10, 3, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out, talking about Jesus as our shepherd. You specifically, individually, wants to speak to, wants you to know his voice and know what he's saying. Revelations 3, 20 says, look, I stand at the door and I knock and if you hear my voice and open the door I'll come in we'll share a meal together as friends so we create this space for God to speak to us and really these these vertical channels of grace they come through places of worship in our life spending time reading the Bible come through prayer and when that happens, you begin to recognize God speaking to you in all kinds of ways. And for my own life, I think, about, I think about all the crazy ways God speaks. Sometimes it's in the middle of a worship service like we just had, and it just feels like God impresses something on my heart. Honestly, sometimes I have like the Bible app on my phone. It comes up with the verse of the day every single morning. I cannot tell you how many times the verse of the day has been exactly for me that day. And that might seem crazy, like it's going out to how, I don't even know how many people it goes out to every single day. But I love, I love this quote that William Temple says, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't, they don't. <laughs> There's this place where you begin to recognize him. Man, I feel like that message, that was so for me. Like somebody just like prayed the exact thing that I needed to hear. I went to life group and they were talking about the very thing I've been, I've been struggling with. You begin to watch God speak through all of these channels in your life. I think about all the biggest transitions in my life and they, they were really the result of God speaking to me. And I just believe here today, God wants to speak to you in a new way. Yes. And if it's been a while since you've heard him individually saying, here's what I have for you. I believe God wants to give you a their word today. Here's what I have for you in 2020. Here's the there I want to take you to. Here's the second thing that we need to have is the second thing is we got to align our habits with our direction. So once God speaks, then we got to, we got to look at our habits and we got to line up where it is we are going with where it is he's taking us. Back Many, many years ago, Danny actually ran a cold stone for a while. And, and one of our funnest things, I actually, 
<laughs> we actually, he hired me to be his um, ice cream. We were dating at the time. I, I did the, the ice cream cakes, I did, uh, decorated them. I'm trying to think of the word. I decorated the cakes. He actually fired the girl before me and gave me the job. I didn't even have to, I didn't even have to apply for it. I'm just, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Some kind of blessing going on there. And, uh, and one of our, our favorite things that we would do is we would have these interview days and all of these like high school students and college students would come in and they would apply. But one of the best things, right, is when they would show up with like their mom for the interview. <laughs> like when your mom comes with you to the interview, it's a bad day. <laughs> and like if, if you've never had that thought, that's a good thought to have, right? <laughs> Like, whoever wants the job should be the one that shows up at the interview because on the other side of it, you're thinking, like, who, who are we hiring here? Are we hiring you or are we hiring mom? And the habits didn't necessarily line up with what it is that they wanted in their life. James 2 says, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds, I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Get the word from God. Hear him. And you line up your habits to go where it is he's called you to do. And I just want to be clear. There's just no amount of good works that can ever earn us salvation. That is a gift from God alone, right? He's, it's the only the only thing that he can do on our behalf is he has to come in and by placing our faith in him, he actually rescues us into that place of being able to call him Abba, Father. But after that moment, then there's a horizon waiting for you. And you got to be willing to get in the boat. You got to be willing to go where it is he wants you to go and your habits are creating your future. What habits need to change in 2020 in order to go where God's wanting to take you. Here's my third thing, is you got to commit to the journey. You got to commit to the journey because what it is that God has for you isn't something that you get there in a moment. God has something on the horizon and it might take you all year long. It might take you years. It might take you decades. But the place that he has for you is spectacular. I remember going to Glacier Park, one of our favorite places that we go to up in Washington. And, and you can kind of get to a couple of things just by a, like a couple hour hike. Incredible, these waterfalls that are just spilling off of the walls of these, these huge canyons. And the, the water is just crystal clear blue. The glaciers are melting into these pools and it's just incredible. I love looking at all of it, but the places that are most incredible, they take a little while to get into. You don't get there in a couple hours. You got to commit to the journey. You got to be willing to invest. And it says inside of Galatians 6, 9, let us not lose heart in doing good for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. God's called you to something. And the only way that you can get to where he's called you to do is by leaning in to the strength and the grace that he has for you to get there. And I want to go back to this story about Jesus and his disciples. Before he's having this breakfast, breakfast with them on the beach, there's actually this moment that happens in the water. I'm going to read it to you inside of John 21 and and it says, at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach and the disciples, they couldn't see who he was. And if you remember, they're out there, they've been working all night and they haven't caught any fish. Gone back to what they know and they're not even doing that great at what they know. And he calls out and he says, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. And he says, throw out your net on the right hand side of the boat. And you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. And the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. There's a supernatural grace that you can't really plan for. When you hear him, you line up your habits with where it is that God's called you to go. And then you commit to the journey, God, however long it takes, whatever it is you want to do through me, there's this supernatural element that you can't plan for that God begins to produce results inside of your life, that they are supernatural. 
They're not anything that you could have ever prayed for or ever asked. It's beyond all expectation. It's beyond everything that you could ever even imagine for your life. And whatever God has asked you to do, he'll provide the means to do it. Wherever it is he's leading you, he's going to open the doors. I think if there's any place in your heart or any place in your life where you've just settled into maybe apathy, you've stopped believing for the impossible, God would want to stir up something inside of you again today to believe for him to do what you can't do for yourself. And Ephesians 3.20 says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. You have no idea what's on the other side of the horizon. No idea what's waiting for you. When you let God lead you into it, something that changes everything about your life. I believe the spirit of God would look over every inch of who you are, every inch of your life, and possessively he would say, it's mine. It's mine, and I have a plan for it. I have a plan for your job. I have a plan for your relationships. I have a plan for everything about you. So today, I just want to pray with you as we wrap up here today. If you'd bow your heads and close your eyes. I just want to pray that you would hear the voice of God. You'd hear him speaking. Here's where maybe you are, but here's you're there. Here's where he's called you to go there's been any place inside of your heart that's just grown weary or tired, maybe you've stopped believing for what it is that he's called you to, or maybe this is a brand new idea. God, right now, we're just praying for your grace. God, would you meet us in this place and what we don't, we don't understand. It's a brand new reality for us. God, just like, just like these little foster kids are coming into a relationship that they've never known before. God, there's something brand new that's waiting for them inside of this relationship. God, we're asking that you'd open up our eyes and we'd see what we haven't seen. God, let there be revelation inside of our spirits. And God, I'm asking that you would speak to every individual in this place, God, for every couple. God, I'm asking that you would speak to every family, to every young person. God, we'd be a people that hear your voice. God, we'd align our habits, be willing to follow you. God, wherever it is you want to lead us and take us. God, we'd commit to the journey. And God, that you would do far more in and through us, just like the disciples. God, all of a sudden they began to haul in a catch that they just, just had no, no plan for, no ability to do on their own. God, you began to do through them. I'm praying that for every individual in this place. God, they would be surprised by your grace in their life. God, we love you here today. God, may you receive all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.